Hello, uh, my name is Bradley Alisab, and I'm going to talk to you today about DevoLearn, the 10,000 meter view. And so this is a broad overview of what we've been doing in DevoLearn since its inception, how it started, and up to the modern day, which is at the end of November of 2023. We've had a number of people work on DevoLearn. Uh, I'm just listing here myself and our Google Summer of Code people. Uh, there have been other people to work on it as well. And uh, so if your name is missing here, efforts are still appreciated. Himanshu Shogol, Mayuk Deb, Minak Deb, Wataro Karakami, Jia Hong Li, Karan Lohan, Hare Krishna Pillai, Sushmant Reddy, Asmit Singh, Ujwal Singh, and Vinay Varma. Uh, we're sponsored by the Open Worm Foundation. We're part of the Open Worm Foundation. And this is the Devil Worm Group. So this is the larger Devil Worm Group. So Devil Learn had its origins in an activity that we did in the Devil Worm Group called Devil Worm ML. And this was in the fall of 2019. So if you think back to the fall of 2019, this is before COVID, we had noticed that people wanted to learn about machine learning, but in the context of development. And so we had actually sponsored some Google Summer Code projects and people have been working on different things. So we decided we wanted an ML program. And so we started this series of courses that happened on Mondays. Uh, I think it was like about a 16-week course of uh, meetings where we would go through different readings, different topics. I prepared a lot of uh, presentations. We had other students prepare presentations, working projects that we wanted to incorporate machine learning and deep learning into them, the syllabus actually is still available. So this is a bit dated maybe uh, with respect to the state-of-the-art techniques out there. But this is a good way to understand kind of like how you might integrate these methods into developmental biology and biology more generally. During this <clears throat> period, I think it was very fertile and that it really set the agenda for what would become DevoLearn. We ended up um, publishing a a discussion or, or a call for involvement on the node. And the node is a blog run by uh, the company of biologists. They run a little community for developmental and stem cell biologists, and this is their blog. So we posted on the blog discussing what we wanted to see in a pre-trained model for developmental biology. So we had to kind of name our terms as what, what needs to happen in order for this to come to fruition. And so at that point, we had, you know, we didn't have any of the people who were actually involved in the development in the group yet. So it's, it's kind of interesting that this is, Evil Learn has really served to bring a lot of people into the organization. So, you know, what are we looking for when we talk about applying machine learning and deep learning to developmental biology? What exactly does that mean? And so I think it, basically the four things we want to focus on. Uh, the first is some of the things we're working on with axolotl brain development, tools that we can develop to improve the process of gaining insights and understanding some of the microscopy that you can do with axolotl. So axolotl is a model organism, and as it's developing, the embryo is very large and transparent at the top, so you could look at brain development very directly in a unique way. And so... One of the, a lot of the things that are lacking in the axolotl community is, you know, tools to really kind of turn this into a quantitative endeavor, turn this into a modeling and quantitative endeavor. And so, you know, this is one of the things we can bring to this um, area. Another area we can focus on is theory building to explain developmental processes. And so oftentimes theory in biology is often described as sort of like a spherical cow, and this is an example here where you have a spherical cow, and that term comes from physics where they talk about, um, you know, untoward assumptions of the data. So the old joke goes, uh, I can describe how to milk a cow as a physicist. Step one, imagine a spherical cow in a vacuum. And so the implication is immediately, it doesn't have any connection to the real world. It doesn't have any connection to the problem. Uh, but that's not really true. That's just a joke. In fact, a lot of times we use a lot of abstract models to model things precisely because they can give us insights into some of the, the things that, you know, experimentation 
and direct observation cannot. And so we can use deep learning and machine learning to, to sort of build some of these models to gain insights, to take data and reproject it into other kinds of spaces that may not be intuitive to a biologist, but can still yield insights. The third uh, area is diatom cell colony morphology. So this is where we've been working on uh, diatom colonies, in particular the genus Bacillaria. And you can see here we have uh, actually have done some work on these kind of colonies that spread out and they move across back and forth like an accordion. We have a video on our diatom work on our YouTube channel. It's a separate video. If you're interested, you can look at that video and read some of the papers we published on this. But basically, we can analyze cell colony morphology through image segmentation, through looking at physics simulations, and other things. So, you know, there, there are different ways we can look at, and this can apply to things other than our diatom example. A lot of single cell colonies or single cell organisms that exhibit morphogenesis can be analyzed using these techniques as well. And then the last thing we're interested in is C. elegans embryogenesis. And I say C. elegans because that's our immediate interest, but we have we can apply our model to other types of embryogenesis. And in fact, embryogenesis is very diverse. You know, you have C. elegans, but you also have Drosophila, you have uh, humans, you have mouse, you have caterpillars, you have other types of embryos that are, you know, spider embryos, things that have been well-defined in a microscopy sense, but maybe not in a quantitative sense. And so we want to do, one of the core things about medieval learn is we want to be able to segment cells in an embryo and then get an account of their identities and their positions and other properties of those cells so that we can then do things like simulate and uh, analyze some of the features of embryogenesis. Really, DevilLearn has been built on Google Summer of Code. I like to thank Google and their efforts in uh, promoting open source software development. And so the Summer of Code is one key element of our efforts, but also it's, it's a very good program through Google that hopefully retains its value over time. We're at the 20th anniversary of Google Summer of Code. The 2024 season will be the 20th season of it of Google Summer of Code, and they've, they've really, there are a lot of groups that have benefited from this program. So you can see that we have, going from 2019 to 2023, we've got 11 contributors, 11 separate projects that kind of have been summarized in this platform. So in 2019, we sponsored two students for developmental deep learning. That was Azmet Singh and Vinay Varma. And that kind of laid the groundwork for what we were going to be doing later. We needed then, you know, we, we had published that uh, blog post that was the outcome of our curriculum in the fall of 2019. It was kind of a follow-up to this Google Summer Code project in part, in fact. So in that article, we decided that we really needed to have a pre-trained model that could be deployed to look at development. So the developmental deep learning efforts in 2019 were successful, but we needed to add on to that. So one of the things we wanted to do was to have a pre-trained model that might be pre-trained on, you know, cell lineages or things like, you know, other types of attributes of an embryo to improve performance on some of these deep learning and machine learning tasks. And so in 2020, we had two students, uh, Mayuk Deb and Ojwal Singh, and they worked on these kind of models. We had a couple of models come out of that summer. We had a pre-trained model, and we had some other models related to the Bacillaria work that are also available. And they're kind of a secondary aspect of DevilLearn, but it's still a part of DevilLearn. Um, in 2021, then, we had uh, Mynok Deb, and he worked on improving DevilLearn and kind of bringing things together. And then in 2022, we started to branch out a little bit. We, we wanted to do two other things. We wanted to develop a graph neural network interface, and we wanted to develop a what we call digital microsphere. And the digital microsphere is related to the work on axolotl that I had mentioned earlier. So in axolotl, we have these uh, microscopy images where you can look at the different cells in the embryo, we can acquire it using different types of microscopy. 
And there's innovation there I'm not going to talk about in this talk so much. But suffice it to say that we need to be able to project those images into a sphere. And then you can explore a sphere, much like you might explore a globe in a virtual environment. So, you know, Google Maps does this where they take data from a sphere, which is the surface of the Earth. They project it into two-dimensional space, and then they ha you can explore it through um, a window. So you can explore it through a, a window where you go over the map and you can, you know, zoom in or uh, annotate it as you'd like. Uh, so that that's what they did there. And they have some software, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, then we had, so that was uh, Hare Krishna Pillai and Karan Lohan worked on that. Uh, then we had uh, our effort on graph neural networks, and that something called DGNNs, which is Developmental Graph Neural Networks. And so we had two students there, Wataro Kawakami and Jia Hong Li. And uh, Jia Hong especially worked on developing a pipeline for efforts. So we needed to have a segmentation part of the uh, project, which, of course, we had been working on image segmentation ever since the beginning of, of Diva Learn's development, but also a graph embedding step and then a topological data analysis step. So it's basically getting information out of it, microscopy images, building a graph embedding, which actually ties into the work that our group has done on embryo networks and hyper networks, and then building um, like a topological data analysis, a data analysis step where you can analyze these networks on a surface, like such as an embryo. So, you know, we laid out that pipeline. We worked on some code that was, you know, we got through stage one. We integrated it with what was going on with some of the pre-trained models and some of the other image segmentation. But we also then worked towards the graph embeddings part. So we've kind of branched out from the uh, image segmentation to these other modules. And so image segmentation is sort of the core thing we'll talk about about how it's been developed and some of the techniques we've used. So that brings us to this last summer, 2023. We had two students, Sushma Threddy and Tamantra Shogel, and they worked on their projects. Uh, uh, Sushma has been, you know, doing sort of a post back in our group. So that means he's doing things after his graduation with his undergraduate degree. And he's trying to do things, you know, to improve his standing for graduate school, which he wants to do. So he's been working on a number of improvements to Diva Learn, and we'll talk about some of those later. Manchu then picked up the mantle on DGNNs, and he worked on a lot of the topological data analysis. So in last summer, we did a lot of improvements on the image segmentation, but also some of the modules for topological data analysis as well. So you might be wondering, what kinds of input data do we use? And what kinds of data transformations are we interested in making? Because a lot of this comes down to good input data. If we don't have good input data, a lot of the other stuff doesn't really matter. So there are sorts of different types of input data. In the C. elegans community, one reason we focus on it is because there's a lot of open source data that you can acquire. But in general, there's a lot of biological data out there that exist. Uh, un, sort of unanalyzed, and part of that is because it's hard to analyze because it's just images, and you know you can kind of use something like uh, Image J or Fiji to you know do some analyses. But there's a lot more you can do with with uh, like especially microscopy data. So you know the first thing is like this kind of light microscopy where you have. You know, it's a C. elegans development where you have this proliferation in different cell types, you know, over time. So you want to be able to mark the nuclei or maybe a centroid of a cell. You want to be able to mark the membrane boundary. You want to be able to do this over what we call developmental time. So you want to show this proliferation over developmental time. And then over time, you get this proliferation of cells, but you also get the formation of patterns. So in a minute, this is going to form a comma shape. And this is another thing we want to capture is this transformation of shape. So you start to see this is starting to form, uh, you know, distinct shapes 
within the embryo. So this is the comma that's forming here. You can see that the comma goes like this. And this is a stage in C. elegans development. And the question is, how do you get there? What are the things involved? Another thing is C. elegans embryogenesis. This is using an M. cherry stain. This is in fluorescent mi light sheet microscopy. So you can see here, if we're looking at the cells, we can kind of tell where the nuclei are. We can kind of tell where the, the membrane boundaries are, but it's really hard really for a machine or even a human to pick out exactly where those boundaries are. And so we'll use light microscopy to, to demarcate the process. We can do transformations to the images from this movie, but we can only go so far. A lot of times we'll use fluorescent markers. So this is M. cherry stain. You can also use GFP or YFP or RFP. They just provide like a fluorescent marker that you can then separate from the background and define things like the body, the cell body, cell membrane, the cell nucleus, and so forth. So this is fluorescent light sheet. This is the same type of imaging here, but it's just under a UV light. And you can see that there are these signals that show up that demarcate these things. And you can see that it's doing this over the course of embryogenesis. So you capture that whole embryogenetic process, but you also get these features predefined in the image. So this is one aspect of pre-training. You can use uh, you know, fluorescent images. So the fluorescent images act as a pre-training step. You can also use cell, because in C. elegans we have good cell lineage data. We can use lineage data, or we can use positional data or you know developmental time or whatever and so thank you to the sources of these data Stephen Prebich and Goldstein Lab at UNC Chapel Hill. This is another example of what we might want to do. We want to maybe model the membranes of cells so we go from an image like this where we know where the cells are <clears throat> and then we can model the cell as sort of a, a geometric volume. We can extrude geometric volumes from the distance between the centroids or the, or the nuclei and then fill in a sphere or an oblong sphere like this. And so we can fill it in using these kind of uh, improvised or predicted volumes. And so this is a, a technique that Kyle et al. from BMT Bioinformatics, they published on this kind of membrane modeling. It's three-dimensional uh, MMS, whatever. it's just their type of membrane modeling. And they've been able to reconstruct uh, cell volumes from C. elegans. So we can use, they have a set of open source tools for this. We can incorporate this into our platform and do really interesting things with it and make it accessible to biologists who just want to answer questions or to people who want to develop the software further. And so we have actually source data sets that we can use for this, uh, as I mentioned. So one of the source data sets that we use a lot is the cell tracking challenge. So if we want to say train our models, we need to have data that are uh, well characterized and you know have a sort of a value for uh, this type of enterprise. So the cell tracking challenge is good because it's already kind of benchmarked on different types of machine learning models. And so there's a paper, uh, Masca et al. in Nature Methods from this year that talks about the 10th anniversary of the cell tracking challenge and some of the things that they've done. And this is a competition that's been put on where, you know, people have used state-of-the-art techniques to sort of get at um, these kind of problems that we're dealing with. So, you know, segmenting and tracking moving cells in a time lapse, that's the task. And it's very hard to do. So you need to apply different types of models. And so along with the models that they have, they also have these data sets that people often use. Another data set uh, specific to C. elegans is the EPIC data set. And this is an older data set, 2006, but it's very useful for what we want to do because it has the right types of signals that we need to extract features like nuclei and even membranes, although that's not the focus. The EPIC uh, data set is a series of embryos at different stages of development where they've looked at uh, different genes using RNAi, they uh, fluoresce these uh, genes in different cells, so you have different cells featured. Uh, so you have ex gene expression data, but also uh, uh, fluorescent signal for a nucleus. 
So you can mark the cell. You can also know what the cell is expressing and at what level is it expressing it. That, that type of data, this is maybe a little bit old for that. There are other data sets that we can integrate in terms of like gene expression and transcriptomics, but I'm not going to feature those there here because it's something we're not really, we haven't worked out that much. So what we end up with is this, you know, these microscopy images. We end up with these series of images over time, but we also get these stacks of images. So some in, in microscopy, oftentimes you'll acquire images in a stack going from the, uh, the dorsal uh, portion of the embryo to the ventral portion of the embryo. And it's, it's a stack where you go from bot basically from bottom to top in terms of reconstruction. You have that information that ranges a number of levels, layers. And so you can actually take those, analyze each image in the stack, and for a certain time point, and get this type of a reconstruction where you're getting this volumetric reconstruction at any one time point, and then have you have volumetric reconstructions for as many time points as you've sampled. And so this is an example of putting that together in a three-dimensional space. And, you know, our group, we have this uh, basic uh, model for sort of quantification, which is where we look at the volume. We're interested in three dimensions of space, X, Y, and Z, although that's not, you know, we might have more dimensions of space in there um, as we see fit. And you say, well, what other dimensions are there in space? And the answer I give is, I don't know. I mean, there may be other dimensions in space that we need to worry about. It's very hard to say. Um, not saying that development has like this secret, you know, aspect of, uh, you know, physics, but we can talk about this, you know, later. Um, but we also have in our model, we have volume, but we also have time and division angle. And so one aspect of this is time. So these volumetric reconstructions happen as a volume, a discrete volume, but also over time. So you have a number of volumes over time and there's change in those volumes that occur <clears throat> because you get more cells, you get more, you know, the structure of the uh, membranes change, you get different, you know, migration events and, and patterns. So we can look at that. And so we can look at the volumes over time and then there's a division angle. So cells will divide when you get more cells in, in the new volume, that means a cell is divided and turned into two, two daughter cells. Cells can also die, but more, more often in development, they uh, give birth to two cells. And so those two cells will split from one another in space. And so there's a division angle that you can characterize. And that's an interesting thing that we're interested in uh, in the group more generally, but something maybe we can address with some of these techniques. So this is an example of a division angle, and this is something we published in Neuroinformatics. It's from Figure 7 of this Neuroinformatics paper we published in 2022. And we have this two-dimensional map of the embryo, so this is not three-dimensional. This is just two-dimensional. And it, this is just showing these angles, an example of how they work. So we start with P0, which is the first cell that's at fertilization. We divide into A, B, and P1. We divide further into different, uh, you know, different division events, and they occur at a certain time in development. So oftentimes, you know, we'll have like P0 divide immediately. And then 17 minutes later, A, B, and P1 will divide. And that those divisions all have like certain angles. You can find those cells in certain locations. And so you can take those locations and say, how much did this cell how much did the nucleus basically have to move or the cell have to move to a new position uh, and what is the angle of that division. So when a cell divides, it has an, an orientation and then it migrates out the two cells and there's an angle. And so does that angle mean anything and what does it look like? And so we can build these kind of maps. And this is not built with machine learning. This is the kind of training data you can provide as well. It's a very second order thing. And so this division angle is important in development. So back to the more utilitarian stuff that we've done in the project. So, uh, like I said, Sushmant this past year, he's been able to get Diva Worm on Hugging Face. The reason I mention that is because we have our models in a place where people are really, you know, uh, active in terms of machine learning, deep learning. 
And, you know, we've gotten those models up recently, so we haven't had a lot of interaction on it yet, but this is what we're looking forward to doing more of this in the future. So this is, uh, we have three different models on Hugging Face. The Nuclea Segmenter, of course, which we talked about, which gives you these uh, segmented nuclei. You can also segment cells as well, membranes. So our Nuclea Segmenter basically segments out these little blobs, you can see, and they find a center point, they find the blob. The Membrane Segmenter is a little bit different. This focuses on the edges of the membrane, so it can pick out membranes instead of nuclei. It's a different type of task. It requires this outline, so it's a little bit different. We'll talk about that later. And then the lineage population model, which is something that your segmenters will feed into to know kind of where these objects are in space and in time. So the nucleus segmenter and membrane segmenter pull the, inf the features out of the uh, possible feature space, the, the raw data. But then the lineage population model is sort of like part of that pre-trained model, part of that, uh, you know, giving, you know, annotating these segmented things. So that's what we're doing. And this is all on Hugging Face. It's also on GitHub. So uh, if you're interested in participating, please go to those places. So this is our cell nucleus segmenter. So you can see that, you know, basically it's taking the uh, microscopy images, identifying the different uh, uh, nuclei or the centroids that define nuclei. And so you can see that, you know, microscopy images uh, can be quite noisy. And so this is one of the things that we have to deal with. And so, you know, I don't want to make you think that, like, the segmentation task is really easy. You just find the signal and you pick it out. I mean, it's not really that easy, but for a machine, it's pretty easy. You can have a lot of noise in microscopy images, from autofluorescence to, you know, different types of uh, things in the, in the image that get, during the of acquisition of the image, the background may be really hard to discern from the signal and so forth. So this is an example on the left of a noisy image. This is a signal on the right of the segmentation map that gets pulled out of that noisy image input. And so you can see that it does a pretty decent job, but it's not complete. And so there's a reason for that. And one of the reasons is noise. The other reason is it's trying to predict from the observed pattern that it sees. So you can see that sometimes it's not quite locking onto the cells, and that's perfectly ex to be expected. Um, but we can use different types of techniques. So we've been working on this nu nucleus segmentation probably several years in a row, trying to improve upon it and finding different methods for it. So, you know, we've used semantic segmentation. We've also used regular segmentation, non-semantic segmentation. And, of course, you know, we can use both of these. We want to use semantic segmentation. We should have, you know, a good example of like labels. So these cells, we should attach the labels to them as well. With non-semantic segmentation, we want to sort of have a raw acquisition. We don't need to train the model, but that comes with some drawbacks as well. So it just really depends on your use case. So, you know, we've used a number of methods. We've used RNN models and watershed methods, so recursive neural networks and watershed methods to extract features such as nuclei and membranes. And so these are, you know, of course, noise dependent, but also label dependent in some cases. In our pre-trained segmentation model, and this is an animated GIF of this, where we have an original image on the left, a segmented image on the, in the middle, where we just segment out the membrane, and then a segmented plus centroid model, where we take, say, our membrane segmentation, which you see in the middle, and add information about the cell centroid which is maybe from the nucleus segmenter or just from a computation of the shape of the cell. So like if we know that the cell is a certain shape and volume, we can compute a centroid and put it in the image along with the uh, edge of the membrane. So we basically have two pieces of information on the image at the right. We have the information about the centroid or the nucleus. We have information about the edge of the cell or the membrane. And so we can do these kind of pre-trained models. We can use semantic segmentation. This is what we used here. This was trained on a C. elegans embryo. That's an example of our segmented semantic segmentation. But we also now have uh, non-semantic segmentation. And this was Sushmat's work. Uh, the pre-trained model was 
uh, Verdry, uh, Myok, and Mynok, Deb. So they worked out a lot of the details for that. This is Sushmat Reddy, and he worked on the segment anything model. So he, this is a thing that Meta has developed recently. He's an early adopter. He created a fork of the segment anything model. He actually created a fork of CellSAM, which is something another group is working on. And he's been able to work out some details on this model to apply to DivaWorld. So this is where you basically can segment things using a prompt. So instead of using like a label, we can use a prompt. So in this case, we've used a label. Sometimes we do hand-drawn uh, training examples of what the membrane should look like. Sometimes we use labels, formal labels, like names or nomenclature, whatever. In this case, we can use just a prompt. And so, and that's enough to get this image, uh, you know, segmented. So in the case of our instance of cell SAM, or segment anything, or what they call SAM, uh, you can use a bounding box or label prompt. So we can use the kind of semantic information with a label, but we all can also use a bounding box, which just means drawing a bounding box and having it snap to the image that you want to, or the feature that you want to segment. So it basically works in, in a similar way as the pre-trained model, um, but it's maybe an improvement upon it. We'll, we'll see. But anyways, both of those are available in our code base, and you know we, we can use this in different ways for different types of problems. We can also do things with pre-trained GANs. So one of the advantages of pre-trained models is you can fit it into a GAN, which is a, a generative, generative adversarial network. And you can build this embryo generator model. So, you know, GANs were really popular several years ago. People have argued that maybe diffusion models are better. But for now, we've got our generative adversarial network model, and we're using this to generate embryos. So you can see here, we can generate a number of different types of embryos from the training data. So given some training data, we can generate different types of embryos. We can build a generative structure out of nucleus segmentation, and it feeds into this kind of architecture. So this is an example here, this uh, citation, Generative Models of Morphogenesis and Developmental Biology, where they kind of just review some of the applications of GANs to developmental biology. We've developed our work separately from this, but uh, it's a nice review to read. And so one of the big issues we're dealing with here that we can sort of extract out of a lot of this work is the concept of developmental time. So we want to know, first of all, what is the flow of developmental time with respect to cell division, cell migration, cell differentiation, and changes in shape in the embryo. So you can see that you go forward in time, you get certain changes. If you go backward in time, which you can't do, so I can't go, say, from a comma back to a mass of cells, or I can't go from this pretzel at the, at the right-hand side to back to the comma. You have to go forward in time, and everything unfolds in that way. And so, you know, first of all, that's a good piece of information for training your models. But secondly, and maybe more importantly, it helps you understand, like, this process of development. How is it being self-organized, and how is it uh, proceeding? And so, you know, we can do this. We can use our generative models based on this concept to build, you know, different types of embryos. We can maybe perhaps generate possible mutant phenotypes if we can train it on mutant phenotypes. We can look at per, per, potentially gene plus environment or gene times environment interactions where you have genes and environment interacting. We can build genetic regulatory network models to sort of augment what we're doing with our machine learning and deep learning. And then we have phenotypic constraints. So as this unfolds in time forward, there are constraints in what kinds of phenotypes can be there. So you can't, for again, you can't go backwards from a comma to a mass of cells or from a pretzel to a comma, but you can go forward from a comma to a pretzel. So the embryos you generate have to look that way. They have to proceed in that manner. So it constrains what we can generate, but it also is more informative. Uh, so another thing we have in our... Uh, in our pantheon of models is this lineage population model. And so this is basically where we can take our segmented images and we can attach lineage tree information. And of course, in C. elegans, the lineage tree has famously been worked out. So it's well known. 
And so cells will divide and they, they're deterministic with respect to their fate. And they have a certain timing, except for the uh, mutant phenotypes, which have a different, a little bit, you know, the timing is a little bit altered. But that's, you know, those are specific cases and we know what those are for the most part. So, you know, this is a good model. Uh, this is a good model organism for which to develop this lineage population model. So what we did here was we predicted different sublineage trees in an embryo. And then, you know, we predicted this from like, the data that's out there on these lineage trees. So you know at what point in time you should see different cells emerge. And so we know what the probability of each cell is in the embryo at a certain time. So we know that what's predicted. And then we know like what our data is in our embryo. So we're segmenting data from the embryo images. We can take those uh, information, we can label them, and then we can use that observation to test against the prediction. So the prediction is something that's been worked out by hand or by you know whatever method we're using. And in our in this case that I'm showing you here, it's just using the you know some random uh, analysis of microscopy data against these predictions. And so you can see that the there's more of a step function in the observed data, and that's kind of an artifact of the segmentation. But we have this uh, predicted uh, trace in or this time series in in the dotted line, and so basically it's keeps pace with it. It's always consistent with what is predicted. It's a little, it looks a little bit different because of some of the artifacts of acquiring the data and you know putting it in the graph, but basically they match up. So this is a nice uh, set of predictions done using a ResNet 18 model. Again, not the, the highest state of the art, but we've been able to work this out well. And so lineage population models are useful for sort of predicting the lineage tree, sort of keeping your input data honest, making sure that the model is working well, but also perhaps predicting things for mutant phenotypes. And so this is an example on the left of post-embryonic sub lineage. So this is where after the C. elegans hatches, it has this M sub lineage that develops differently in the hermaphrodite than the male C. elegans. And so we know that like we can take maybe one of these sub lineages and you know we know what the, it's supposed to look like over time and match it up with some observation to make sure that our model is working well. We can also do this at the P sub lineage. So this is again in post embryonic C. elegans between hermaphrodite and male. So there are differences between the two. So we can also do this with uh, with our model to you know take any set of observations and match them to what's known in the lineage tree. We can even go further out than that. Like I said, we've been working on this DGNNs project, which is uh, developmental graph neural networks. So we have. Uh, separate work on embryo networks and embryo hypergraphs. And so we can actually use this to sort of build these kind of network embeddings, these graph embeddings, and hyper network embeddings. And so we have, again, our uh, observed data, and we can segment the uh, membranes, and we can also impute the centroids. And then we can take that and build a node map. So we can build a node map from the centroids of each cell. And then we can compute a distance matrix based on this, this node map. And then we can build a network embedding or a graph embedding or a network topology for, you know, for distance between the cells. But we can also use other criterion once we know what the cells are and what they look like and their position. We can say things maybe about intercellular communication. Or we can say things about, you know, their location in the embryo. What do we expect from the anterior portion versus the posterior portion? What do we observe in terms of changes in the network topology, the graph embedding? What do we expect in terms of the biology that's happening there? So we can build complex networks. Potentially, these could be bidirectional graphs, but, you know, they don't need to be directed. And these are built from cell segmentation and cellular attributes, but also we can incorporate uh, lineage trees and other information into these graphs. So again, you know, we've been doing things with embryo networks, but those embryo networks kind of look like spherical cows in a vacuum. 
Um, we do this for reasons of understanding the graph structure. So we want to understand, uh, like for example, how structured the graph is. You know, if it's uh, random or if it's uh, a scale-free network or whatever. So this is a plot from our biosystems paper in 2018 that talked about these kind of embryo networks. And again, we used a circular network which does like you know pairwise uh, comparisons between cells, their location, other attributes. Um, but we can do this, you know, in three dimensions. We can do this um, for for a number of different things. We just have to plug in the data. We can, you know, analyze our input data and then, you know, use our pre-trained approach to augment that. We can also build the distance matrix or various types of matrices to build these graph embeddings that maybe uncover, you know, uh, different types of connectivity information in the embryo. So that brings us to developmental graph neural networks. So this is a higher level. So we still have the segmentation uh, imperative where we need to segment cells and derive the centroids of the cells. And so in graph neural networks, the centroids are very important. The nucleus segmentation is important. Uh, you know, we can use uh, membrane segmentation and impute the, uh, the centroid, but you know, it's, it's just as, you know, either method can work for this. The point is we need good segmentation techniques underlying this. So we have that, we can do this in three dimensions. We can build these little three-dimensional cloud, point clouds, have them in a, a, a metric space of some type. Then we construct the graph embedding. So this is where we try out different types of connectivity and sort through that those different types of connectivity on all of these cells. So this point cloud has different types of you know, connectivity depending on the criterion you use. You construct a number of graph embeddings and then select the best graph embeddings. And then we can model and do type, different types of topological data analysis. So this is a graph that Hamanchu developed this last summer, uh, cell birth versus lifetime. And so this kind of gives us some information about that in these graph embeddings. So it's, it's kind of hard to interpret. This is a topological data analysis thing. But <clears throat> basically, we can get the metrics and, and graphs that we need to do the analyses and, and to say something about the embryo. Um, so this is where we're going with our a lot of our network work and our graph work is to one of our potential endpoints. So you can see that the cell segmentation underlays all this. If we don't have good cell segmentation, we don't have good graph embeddings, then we can't do our analyses. And so uh, DGNNs and DevoGraph, which are, you know, the DevoGraph is sort of an instance of DGNNs, that's available on GitHub at this address. And I'd just like to say we haven't really, uh, you know, written a paper on all of this, but it's coming forth, so it'll it'll be out soon. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what the future holds for this. So I mentioned before digital microspheres, and this is another sort of uh, part of the Devo Learn umbrella. Uh, this is something we worked on in 2022. So basically, we have this sort of specialized type of microscopy. This is what we call a ball microscope. One of our contributors, Susan uh, Crawford Young, she develops these kind of microscopes. She developed this ball microscope where you put an embryo on the stage, which is in the center of the sphere. And then you have these cameras that point to that sphere at different orientations. And then you can capture all those images and, and stitch them together in a, an interface. So this is an axle bottle embryo. You take images from different perspectives of that embryo on the stage and then you can see that you know it, it images only a certain part of that surface but if you stitch things together into a spherical in a spherical manner you get the entire surface stitched onto a sphere so this is what this interface is um, so you have this output image you tile the sphere and you know kind of looks a little bit weird but you can rotate it so you can see different points on the sphere so that's where we're working, and we've been working on this. Uh, I think Ari Krishna has talked about developing a, a NERF or a neural radiance field model for this. So we're improving upon the models underlying this, but also it's a visualization tool that allows people to explore it. So one of the big challenges there was to getting the spherical mapping done, but we've seemed to have gotten that, and now we're just working on improving the model. 
And so this is, stay tuned for more information on this. Uh, so the overview of the DevoLearn architecture as it stands right now, we have our core DevoLearn component, which is the pre-trained models, the segmenters, the Winniage model, and the GAN. So we have the segmenters, the membrane segmenter, the nucleus segmenter. We have the pre-trained aspect, which is pre-training the model on um, you know, different types of images or different nomenclatures. We have the lineage model, which is specific to the cell lineages, predicting those. And then we have the generative aspect or the GAN. And we've been building this out by, you know, using this core to sort of inform different other things that we want to do. So we built the digital microspheres model, which relies on image segmentation from, you know, our bomb microscope. We can also incorporate other types of things like lineage models or generative models into that. Of course, we have the DGNNs or graph neural networks, which are, you know, developing these graph embeddings. And then we have DevoRM AI, which are these species-specific models. So we can actually plug these species-specific models in early into the pre-training step or into the segmenter or lineage model. And we can use these kinds of techniques for other organisms, not just C. elegans. And so this brings us to our vision for user and participant interaction. So who's going to be using this? We have had this released, uh, you know, for a couple of years now where we've been kind of getting people to use it and, and people have downloaded it, but we've never really had a strategy for different types of users. We've kind of envisioned it as like something that a biologist could use, but it really is something probably more of like software developers are using. So it's not like ideal for our end goal, but we do have other people, you know, multiple levels of what we want to see happen. So we definitely want to have a presence on GitHub. We want to have a repository for people to access the uh, software in an open source manner. We also want to have a development environment. So GitHub is the place for that. If you're interested in the software development aspect, that's the place to go. It's an open source package. You can train it on different model organisms. There are some challenges there, which are, you know, getting access to GPUs and having maintainers in place who can review the work. That's something we were always struggling with. But that's one use case. And then another use case is where we have formal code releases and docs. So we've released the code on uh, PyP, which is, of course, just a place to download uh, releases. But we've also worked on our docs and we're going to continue to work on our docs. So the vision here is to select different features to customize the thing that you're using at the end as an end user and engage with this at your own level of expertise. So you may know something about computing, something about biology, but people vary on those two different axes. And then finally, we want a high level user interface. So we want to have something that's accessible to biologists who maybe know almost nothing about computation. So we want to have a really low barrier to entry for non-computationalists. And this could be even students who don't know like all the details of C. elegans biology or you know whatever, <clears throat> being able to take some of these like obscure model organisms and present them to people without having them need to like become informed about every aspect of the model organism. So we've been working on this as well. <clears throat> now, one thing we have a challenge there is hosting. So, you know, hosting these models in a place, we've solved some of that, but it always it's always in flux. So we have a number of challenges we need to overcome. So we have three future directions. And the first of those is incorporating segmentation models into other components of data collection. So, you know, this involves uh, incorporating your segmentation models into places like DevoGraph, and digital microsphere in different ways. So we have the segmentation architecture down. We just need to apply it uh, broadly. And we need to maybe work on our segmentation models to refine them as well, but that's sort of just kind of an obvious step. So, you know, we really need to make these segmentation models more sort of extensible. The second point is that we want to incorporate uh, this into data collection for modeling methods. So we want to be able to create data sets or at least maybe trained uh, pre-models that are built on uh, collected data but can be applied to things like our, hyper our hypergraphs and cellular automata simulations. So we want to be able to build upon that. We want to have like an intermediate step between our simulations and 
high level analyses in our data collection. So it can make it sort of like, you know, make it more amenable to uh, the data that's out there more amenable to a computational framework. And then finally, we want to incorporate data from other species that could be axolotl, drosophila, or single cell morphogenesis like we saw with the, with the diatoms. And so <clears throat> we have explored a number of those areas, and that's something that we'd like to do in the future.